So we're going to start dawn Friday morning, and we will read in Matthew 27, 12. When the morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So Pilate begins questioning him. He says, are you the king of the Jews? Are you trying to start an insurrection against me? But Pilate is a very shrewd man, and he's been over many of these cases before, and he sees quickly two things. He sees that there's something different about Jesus, and he sees that the uh, Pharisees and priests are envious of him. But while Pilate may recognize that, Pilate is lacking in character, and he has a serious problem that is going to be like a guiding principle through everything he does in this trial. His boss back in Rome is Tiberius Caesar. Now, Tiberius Caesar was an interesting character. Tiberius' father by adoption was Caesar Augustus. This makes Tiberius Caesar the nephew of the infamous Julius Caesar, who was famously murdered by his senators in 44 BC, just 40 years before Jesus was born. Now, over the years, Tiberius Caesar has become a shell of a human being, a monster, really, even by Roman standards and he's committed some of the worst acts this planet has ever seen. If you crossed him in any way, whether you were a fellow uh, peer, a ruler, a man, woman, or child, he would do something very awful to you. Now, this was just the reality in Christ's day. You would take a leap off of Tiberius' leap. He would have you thrown off of the cliff, um, and he would always watch. He was a very demented man. But this was Pilate's boss. I'm trying to paint a picture here. So everyone was terrified of crossing this man. Uh, Pilate had given all, additionally, uh, specific marching orders, or I'm sorry, uh, Tiberius Caesar had given specific marching orders to Pilate on how to deal with the Jewish people, and we still have the actual instructions. He said, change nothing already sanctioned by custom, but to regard as a sacred trust both the Jews themselves and their laws, which are conducive to public order. In other words, try to respect their ways and keep order down there. We've had enough rebellion already. I don't want any more of that. We read in Killing Jesus, so it is that Pontius Pilate honors that sacred trust by strengthening his bond with the high priest Caiaphas, the figurehead of the Jewish faith and the most powerful man in Jerusalem. According to Tiberius' orders, Pilate is not to meddle in matters of Jewish law. It is an order that Pilate will remember all too well. He's thinking of that order now, and he sees that the Jews want this man to die. And he's been ordered to work with these people as much as possible, but he knows that Jesus is innocent. He thinks if I don't get them, give them what they want, this crowd is going to swell into a rebellion, and that rebellion is going to grow and grow, and my psychopathic boss is going to get angry with me. These are the things that were going on in, her, in uh, Pilate's mind. Well, when the Pharisees mention that Jesus is stirring up people in Galilee, he goes, ah, he latches onto that. He says, I can shift responsibility away from myself and put it onto Herod. Herod was incidentally just a couple of blocks away. This was the Passover time and a lot of people were there. So now the whole entourage goes before Herod. And the Bible tells us when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad for he had desired for a long time to see him. And he heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And even though Herod questioned him and questioned him and questioned him, Jesus would not say one word to him. So it begs the question, why did Jesus talk to Pilate, but he would not talk to Herod? Well, you know, Herod had received already an enormous amount of light. Pilate had received none at this point. He'd listened to the preaching of John the Baptist, been convicted, stifled his own conscience, and ended up literally killing the messenger. And notice what the Bible says. Notice how the Bible says it. He, doesn't, he wanted to see Jesus. It did not say he wanted to hear Jesus. He did not want to hear what Jesus had to say. He wanted to see a really cool miracle from Jesus. He thought it would be exciting. But you know, we can apply, we can look down on Herod, of course, but we can apply this principle to us today. If we're coming into God's presence or we want God's presence for the excitement, for the intellectual doctrinal debate, for the feeling we get, that is not why Jesus' presence comes to us. He comes to us so we can have an encounter with him and be transformed. 
Well, Jesus is brought again back to Pilate, and the investigation and the trial keeps continuing. Something really interesting happens. Pilate's wife comes to him and says, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. Remember, it is only like 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning at this point. People are just waking up. If he didn't feel anxiety before, Pilate is starting to sense that something is really unusual, and he needs to figure this thing out. He calls everyone together, and he says, I've examined this man. I find nothing wrong with him. Also, Herod has examined him. He finds nothing wrong with him, thinking that two rulers are going to add some weight to this. But he can tell the Jews are not going to give up on this without a fight. He sees a tumult about to be made. So he comes up with what seems to us today like a horrible, awful solution. He says, I will scourge him and release him. And we're thinking, Jesus didn't even do anything. It's because of the crowd he was dealing with. Now, to receive the Roman whip back then was extremely dreaded. It was a dreaded thing in the ancient world. This was called the, the flagellum. It was not meant as a death sentence, but it did kill many men. This flagellum would have a rigid handle to hold it, leather straps coming off, and there would be lead weights sewn into the end or pieces of bone and metal sewn into the end. The weights would cause deep contusions. The bones and metal would uh, rip into the flesh. And we do get a description of what scourging was like from the book Killing Jesus. I know, I do apologize, I know this is a little graphic, but this was just the reality of Jesus' time. And you know, honestly, sometimes I think we're just too far removed from what people before us went through. This is what people were going through. It says, in the courtyard was where the scourging took place. Low posts were permanently positioned in the ground. A ring would be affixed to the top permanently. The victim would then be stripped, forced to their knees, and their hands were bound to the metal ring. The body was locked in position. There could be no squirming or movement to dodge the blows of the flagellum. Typically, lashes would extend all the way up the upper back down to the calves. Many victims, if they survived at all, would experience severe blood loss, shock, vomiting, and seizures. Now, the historian Eusebius actually watched the scourging, and he did describe it for us. We have an historical account. I don't have it up here, but he said, bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated, the victims, with scourges even to the innermost veins and arteries so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and members, were exposed to view. So a legionnaire would stand on each side so they could deliver continuous blows on each side to the tune of about 39 or 40. The Jews had a law, you could only receive 39. The Romans actually did not have that law at all, they did not abide by it, so he could have received more, we don't know. Next, Jesus was taken to the Praetorium. The entire military garrison gathered around him, uh, placed a robe on him and this crown of thorns and began to mock him and humiliate him. Now, has anyone ever been humiliated? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know I have. We all grew up with that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? I was a pretty small kid growing up in school and I got bullied a lot. I knew that saying was a total lie. So this humiliation, it destroys you from the inside. The damage is unseen, but it's no less devastating. And sometimes its effects can last a lifetime. If you've ever been humiliated in your life, know that Jesus was too. This crown was fashioned next, placed on his head. It was a form of severe humiliation, representing the fact that they had heard he'd call himself a king. We get a picture of the shrub that was used called Ramnus nebica, a tall white shrub featuring inch-long curving thorns that sprout closely together. Now at this point, ask your, we have to ask ourselves, why did Jesus get all this special attention? I mean, Herod had publicly said at this point, I see no fault in the man. And yet here he is, we kind of sort of understand the scourging, but now he's getting all this harassment, humiliation, he's getting punched and all that and hit with canes and rods in the uh, praetorium. Were these soldiers doing this on their own, do you think? Were they being prodded? I think the third of the evil angels were there at that time. You know, Christ had solidly defeated them in heaven and he did not destroy them as they deserved at that time. He let them live, but they couldn't stay there. But now that he was under their control, 
They, did, they showed no such restraint as Christ showed. They did whatever they could to humiliate and torture him. You know, something else that's interesting, the Messianic Psalms and, and the portions of Isaiah that are Messianic portions of Isaiah, they sometimes give us more detail on what actually happened to Jesus than even the Gospel writers do, which is interesting, but they saw things in the Spirit that were very accurate, sometimes inspiring, sometimes disturbing. Isaiah 56 says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And you know, for each one of us, there's going to be a different aspect of his suffering that will just kind of get to you. And for me, it's um, this verse. When I picture them trying to rip out Jesus' beard, it's just so violating. It just makes me angry. And you know, this whole experience, it should make us angry. But it should make us angry, not necessarily at the people that were doing this. It should make us angry at the thing that got Jesus there in the first place, which was our sin. Well, now Jesus was brought back again before everyone, and the priests see they have the advantage now. Because Pilate showed great weakness by scourging him and allowing the garrison to have their way with him. If Pilate had just been consistent and said, no one innocent under my watch is going to be punished, we do not punish innocent people, then they would have had no ground to take. But because of what he did, now they become more and more aggressive. Pilate also at this time brought out a most loathsome prisoner, prisoner, Barabbas. He was a violent murderer, and Pilate was probably thinking, they're not going to want a murderer back in their, in their society. They'll be forced to select Jesus. He says, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? I think, you know, at this point, he was just doing everything he could think of. And, you know, in a way, this may sound weird, but I feel sorry for Pilate. Because the Bible tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And Pilate did not understand that. He was trying to fight what was an intense spiritual battle in the flesh. He was going against the priests, and the priests had the powers of darkness on their side inspiring them. So Pilate says to the crowd, which one do you want me to release? They cry out, um, they cry out Jesus, or, or Barabbas, I'm sorry. They wanted them to release Barabbas. He says, what shall I do with Jesus? It's interesting that he said that. It tells you that he was not even thinking of crucifying him. It was not on the table for Pilate. They cried out, crucify him. And he says, why, what evil have he done? It's incredible if you really think about this scene. He was their ruler. He had ultimate authority over them. It, it wouldn't have been a very good idea, but he could have imprisoned them. He could have executed these people. But instead, he's arguing with them like they're his peers. And this, is how, this was the spiritual battle that he was losing. He did not understand what was really going on. Something really interesting. This whole time, up until this point in the trial, the Jews have been maintaining this lie that Jesus was here for the charge of sedition. This was a blatant lie. But it, I don't know if, if you've ever seen this. I've seen this in my life. When a person tries to maintain a lie, it can only be done for so long. Lies get harder and harder to maintain as time goes on. Well, at this point in the trial, there's some really angry exchanges, and the Jews slip up, and the truth spills out. Pilate says to them, clearly angry, you take him and crucify him. I find no fault in him. This was him finally trying to stand up. He should have realized probably he should have done it before, but now he's trying to stand up, and he's also kind of insulting them. You take him and crucify him like you could. You people have no authority or power. Well, I think that really got to them. And then out came the bombshell from the Jews. We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. I think at that point, Pilate said, what? Because the Bible tells us, therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium. He stopped the whole thing. And he said to Jesus, where are you from? Well, the crowd was crying out even louder, crucify him. The priests were shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend to Caesar. I think that's the threat that finally did it. That threat was understood. Go ahead and let him go. We'll be on the next ship to Rome. 
I think he saw the tumult swelling, growing more and more out of control. I think he saw it moving over the countryside. I think Pilate saw the priest standing in Caesar's presence saying, uh, we have a problem, we have a lack of loyalty with your leader, Pilate. And I think Pilate thought, I could be the next one going off that cliff. Pilate washed his hands. He said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. It's so interesting that he said that. He said, this just person doesn't make any sense. This trial and this crucifixion, it was actually our trial and crucifixion, not Jesus's. He was technically and legally declared innocent. And that he was, the death sentence was immediately carried out anyway. This was about our sins having to deal with. It was really not about Jesus at all. Now from the judgment hall to Golgotha where he was sent was only about seven to 800 yards. And it may not sound like a lot, but you would have a large cross beam placed over your shoulders called a patibulum. They'd be around 100 pounds and it would be tied to your arms. So picture walking seven to eight football fields with a 100 pound uh, piece of wood on your back after you'd been beaten up and almost whipped to death. It probably looked like this. Jesus was car carrying this patibulum all that distance and with everything else that had happened to him and with the weight of the sins of all of our sins bearing down on him at some point he finally just collapsed. And the Bible says Simon of Cyrene was compelled to bear his cross. Did you ever wonder why Simon, why did Simon of Cyrene get chosen to carry Jesus' cross? Was there something special about Simon of Cyrene? Well, we don't know about, a lot about Simon of Cyrene, but we know one thing, he was there. There's something to be said sometimes for just showing up in life. You may feel inadequate, you may feel like God can't use you, you may feel unqualified, but he can't use you and he can't work with you if you're not there, putting yourself out there. Weak and unqualified though you may feel. Simon of Cyrene was there, he was watching Jesus bear the cross, he was beholding Jesus, and before he knew it, he was following Jesus. And that is how a person goes from an unbeliever to a believer, by beholding Christ. The process isn't always easy or fast. It, it does say they compelled him. Does it say he volunteered? He didn't volunteer. And in the same way, many people, when they're first given an opportunity to accept Christ, they may not want to do it either, but if Jesus is upheld, soon they will want to start following him because they will see something that's worth more than anything else this world has to offer. So Jesus is brought to Golgotha. Now the cross was made of two parts, three really. You had the patibulum, which was the horizontal beam. You had the sedulum, which would have been most likely mounted in the ground, and, or the sedulum piece of wood for your feet, and the stipes, which was mounted in the ground. Now the Bible says when they got to Golgotha, they offered him uh, wine mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. So this gall was actually an analgesic, it was a painkiller. It was offered because they knew Jesus was about to experience a high level of pain. So why didn't he take the medicine? I would have taken the medicine. He refused any painkiller, I think, because he, it would have numbed his senses and this spiritual battle that he was fighting for you and me was more important than anything, more important than his own suffering, his own feelings. But I mean, how much courage would it have taken to know what was about to happen to you and to not take that medicine? Jesus was very courageous. I mean, we're talking about a guy who was extremely tough, extremely brave, just his humanity now we're talking about, obviously. I mean, he built whatever was needed with ancient hand tools. He walked 15 to 30 miles a day. He'd go without food or sleep. And you know, society gives us these modern ideas of tough guys. We get them from Hollywood. And these are people who are just acting and live in opulence and luxury. If you want a role model of what a real man is, you look to Jesus Christ, even today. Remember, he was fighting a two-front war this whole time. Spiritually, he was becoming our sin. He was taking the enormous weight of all of our sins, which was, would have been repulsive to him, overwhelming. And physically, he was fighting for his very life under extreme torture. So after the offering of the gall, the crossbeam would have been taken off of Simon and tied on to Jesus. 
Jesus would have been laid on the ground, nailed to the patibulum. I'm sorry, I do apologize. I know this is a little graphic, but this is, this is what happened. These nails would have been around seven inches long, and they would most likely have been placed actually at the end of the wrist where the radius and your ulna meet up rather than in the palms. As it would have been driven in, several things would have happened. It would lacerate your median nerve that runs down your arm. It would completely sever that. And what that would do is you would not feel your hands again. They would go numb permanently. You would, however, have feeling in your arms and you would have what they call causalgia, which is radiating shocks of pain. So your arms would have been extremely painful. But once this was happened, there was really no turning back. It was over for him. He would have been moved up to the stipes and gone through this again with the feet as they um, nailed him to the sedulum. Now, incidentally, the sedulum was not put there as a warm gesture. It seems like it at first, but the sedulum was put there to prolong your agony, and we'll see why in a minute. So at the third hour, or 9 o'clock in the morning, it was only 9 o'clock in the morning when this all happened, Jesus was crucified, and the way they told time back then excuse me, was the third hour was 9 o'clock in the morning, the sixth hour was 12 o'clock in the afternoon, and the ninth hour was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So there's something really interesting about this. Jesus suffered on the cross from the third hour to the ninth hour, the Bible tells us. That's 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. for only six hours. And he was dead on the cross for about one hour before he was taken down. And the way we know that is because of the time of year when the sun would have gone down and they were trying to get him off of the cross before the Sabbath. So he was on the cross for six, hour, six hours, and he was dead for one hour. Six plus one equals what? Seven. I don't think it's a coincidence that it took six days for God to create the world, and he rested one day. And then when he saved the world, it took six hours to save it, and he spent one day resting on the cross. God works in patterns. Well, now the crowd begins mocking and taunting Jesus. He's on the cross. And there was a reason for that. Remember, the priests were mocking him, saying, Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know the primary way the devil tempts you is he planting thoughts in your head. He can't read your mind, but he, he doesn't know what's in it, but he can plant things in it. One of the best ways he does that is he does it through people around you. My point is the devil is never going to actually appear to you and tempt you. If he did that, it would be an incredible increase in your faith because you would have proof of his, of his existence, and he does not want you to be fully sure if he is real or not. And by the way, you pull me aside sometime, and I will tell you I have an experience with this that greatly strengthened my faith. But he's going to use other avenues to get to you. I think the devil is working through the crowd those around the cross trying to stir them up, trying to get Jesus to think about and ponder about and let it marinate in his mind, hmm, I could just come down. This is unpleasant. I don't have to do this. But we talked about in earlier sermons, the way that Jesus dealt with temptation is the way that we need to deal with temptation is that he did not parlay with it for even a moment. And that's how we have to deal with temptation with it, debating about it, pondering it, rationalizing it, when you do that, you're stepping on extremely dangerous ground. But there's something very, very, very interesting about one of the taunts that was thrown at Jesus. And I didn't pick up on it for a long time. Remember, in these passionate moments, truth is coming out. These people are in a rage, and they're not thinking clearly. It says, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. Do you notice something weird about that taunt? I'll read it again. It says, he saved others. Stop. He saved others. If Jesus was a fraud, would they have said he saved others? If Jesus was a fraud, they would have said, this man never saved anyone. All those miracles you heard about, the feeding of the 5,000, casting out demons, raising the dead, that all didn't happen. This man is a complete fraud. They didn't say that. This would have been their perfect chance to testify that none of that stuff ever happened. But instead, they're providing us a historical confirmative statement that Jesus did all the things that we read about in the Gospels. His own enemies gave us that. 
I think that's pretty amazing. Now on the cross, the biggest problem that Jesus had, the biggest problem anyone would have, was not the nails in your hands and your feet. It was not the torn open back, not the blood loss. It was going to be breathing. Breathing on the cross was basically the opposite of what you and I experience. When we breathe in, it takes a little effort. Breathing out, a little less. But the way that they would hang the body with your arms extended out like this, you could take in a breath, but you could not exhale. And it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but you can suffocate with air in your lungs. You start losing oxygen. If you've ever been underwater, how long can you hold your breath? You've still got something in your lungs, right? Well, they could not expel air. The only way they could do it was by pushing up with their legs. That's why Rome had provided the sedulum, the piece for the feet. So every time you wanted to breathe, you would just have a trifecta of pain. Every breath, you would experience lacerating pain in your feet as you pushed up. You would experience lacerating pain in your wrist. You could still feel your wrist as the wounds rotated as you moved up. You would experience lacerating pain in your back because remember, you'd been flogged and you couldn't push off of the cross. You could only go up and down. But you had to do it. What was your alternative? I mean, Rome had perfected this. This was their, their perfect, uh, perfect way to torture people. They knew you'd do anything to take your next breath. And so with every breath, this agonizing cycle would repeat itself. One physician who studied the cross uh, estimated in order for a person to breathe at a normal respiratory rate for the six hours Jesus was on the cross, you would have had to do have done 4,320 half squats to keep breathing. Can anyone here even imagine doing a couple hundred? As you can imagine, your legs would eventually give out, and when they did, your situation got even worse. Your shoulders would start to bear the weight, and your elbows, and they could only do that for so long, and you would experience dislocation, and then you would not be able to breathe for much longer. At the same time, Jesus was experiencing what's called hypovolemic shock. This is slow heart failure because of lack of fluid in the vascular system from all the bleeding, all the dehydration, He'd been bleeding profusely, and he hadn't had a drink since probably the Passover feast. Now, we think all this suffering, I don't know if you have, but I thought, why did it have to be so excessive? Have you ever asked yourself, why couldn't he have just died for our sins in some easier and quicker way? The Romans back then had at least six recognized forms of execution. They were all horrible, but they were all quicker. And the cross was the most excruciating process and the longest process. You know, was the devil just trying to kill Jesus, though? Or was he trying to do something else? The devil was putting him through the ringer because he was trying to get him to stop doing something that Jesus was doing right then that the devil did not like. Something he'd started doing the night before. While Christ was enduring all this pain and suffering, there was one thing that made him want to stay on that cross. There was one thing that kept him doing those 4,320 squat, half squats. There was one thing that kept him going through each agonizing cycle of breathing. He had to make sure he finished something. You remember what he said at the very end of this? He said, it is finished. What was it? He had to atone for each and every last sin the cup of wrath had to be fully drunk into the last dregs. Ending any sooner would have been an incomplete sacrifice, and it would have not have been sufficient to save us. Those words, it is finished, should be the most comforting words that you have, or I have ever heard. Because it's our guarantee, it's our signing over the contract of our salvation. Well, Matthew 27, 45, it says, at the sixth hour or 12 o'clock in the afternoon, something really weird happened. Jesus was three hours in the bearing our sins, and suddenly a thick, terrifying darkness came over the land. Total darkness until the ninth hour or 3 p.m. So dark, I don't think it's going to show up on the slide. Maybe you can see it up there. <laughs> I don't think we can get a picture, though, really, of how awful this was. I mean, just think about if you've ever been eating dinner late at night, suddenly the power goes off, you're with your family, and now you can't see two inches in front of your face. It's kind of disconcerting and terrifying, right? Well, picture 12 o'clock in the afternoon out in the middle of nowhere, and the power just shuts off. 
In the thick darkness, it says, God veiled the last human agony of his son. He was now mercifully hidden by the mantle of God. I think the heavens and the earth could no longer endure the sight. We're reading Desire of Ages again. A nameless terror held the throng that gathered about the cross. The cursing and reviling ceased in the midst of half-uttered sentences. Men, women, and children fell prostrate upon the earth. Vivid lightnings occasionally flashed forth from the crowd and revealed the cross and the crucified Redeemer. Priests, rulers, scribes, executioners, and the mob all thought that their time of retribution had come. After a while, some whispered that Jesus would now come down from the cross. Some attempted to grope their way back to the city, beating their breasts and wailing in fear. So now would be a good time to bring your attention. I don't know if you know, but the Bible is not the only historical document that references Jesus' crucifixion. Probably not going to teach you this in world history. This, this uh, unnatural phenomenon of darkness, this earthquake, and even his crucifixion are referenced in other writings. There's a man named Tertullian in his book Apologeticus. This was written in 197 AD. He wrote, and yet nailed upon the cross, he exhibited many notable signs by which his death was distinguished from all others. At his own free will, with a word dismissed from him his spirit and anticipating the executioner's work. In the same hour, too, the light of day was withdrawn when the sun at that very time was in its meridian blaze. Those who were not aware that this had been predicted about Christ no doubt thought it an eclipse. You yourselves have the account of the world portent still in your archives. Very interesting. Notice Tertullian is referencing some archives that evidently others were familiar with in that day. And I speculate, but I believe, could it have been the Egyptian library in Alexandria which was the world's largest library in the ancient world, had the largest selection of books, records, and archives of anything in the planet at that time, and it was destroyed around 270 AD, so we will never know what was in it. But Tertullian seems to be indicating the accounts of Christ's death may have been in that library. Well, you say Tertullian was a Christian. He could have been biased because of his beliefs. Okay, how about somebody who hated Christians? Tacticus, Roman Senator Tacticus, in his book Annuals, written in AD 116, which, by the way, all Christian and non-Christian scholars agree this is authentic. He says, consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. So what he's referencing here is that there were rumors going around at the time that Nero actually caused the great fire of Rome, and so Nero started putting this uh, on the Christians, saying, well, the Christians did it, and started torturing them, killing them. But the point is here, halfway through, we have an unbiased historical document that references that Jesus was crucified by a man named Pontius Pilate. The Bible is reliable, friends. History plays it out. This Tacticus would have had no reason to lie about this. He thought Christianity spreading was a horrible thing. He didn't even like them. He's just reporting what was happening at the time. We'll read one more quote. In AD 52, there was a man named Thallus. He wrote a history of the Mediterranean world from the Trojan War to his day. And we don't have that work, but we have, it is referenced by another well-respected scholar named Julius Africanus. He referenced it in his book called Extant Writings 23, written, and this was in AD 221 it was written. Uh, Julianus, write, Julianus writes, on the whole world there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus in his third book of his history calls it, it appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. So I just took a little clip of it, but they're referencing the year and month that Jesus died, and they're saying a fearful darkness and a huge earthquake took place in Israel. And although Thallus confirmed this darkness actually did happen, he says, well, I think it was an eclipse. Well, could it have just been an eclipse? Africanic, Africanus says, I disagree. And he has two very good reasons why. They're pretty obvious if you think about it for a minute. How long did the darkness last? Three hours. How long is the largest eclipse that was ever recorded? 
I'll just tell you, eight minutes. Bit of a time difference there. Obviously, it could not have been an eclipse. But, you know, we have another really good reason and an interesting reason as well. The moon can only eclipse the sun when the moon is between the sun and the earth. And we know Jesus died during the Passover. We know when it was. It was 14th day of the sun. We were told the moon was full the night before. When we have a full moon, is it in between the sun and the earth, or is it on the opposite side away from the sun, and the earth is in between the sun and the moon? That's what a full moon is. So we can tell that the sun, or that the moon did not come between the sun and the earth. You know, there's even more historical documentation, um, but we don't have time to read it. I encourage you to study it on your own. To me, it's a very exciting study. There's just so much information out there, but let's get back to the cross. At the ninth hour after this darkness, Jesus cried out and said something very interesting. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's something interesting about that. There's a lot of things, really. But what did Jesus call God? Did Jesus call God God? Or did he say Father? There's hundreds of examples. Me and my Father are one. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. Um, Our Father, which art in heaven. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But he's not calling him Father at this point. He's calling him my God. Why is he doing that? You know, as he drank the last awful dregs of the cup of sin, he felt he was becoming sin. Standing in our place at that awful moment, I think he could no longer see God as his father. I think he saw him now in a different light as the guilty sinner sees a just and offended God with whom we have to do someday if we are not under the bloodstained banner. And I think that's what finally sent his heart and his mind over the edge. And, you know, Jesus died quicker than the average crucifixion victim. Remember, Pilate marveled that he had already been dead. And then Jesus cried out, it is finished. The debt had finally been paid, the cup drunken, the mission accomplished. And he cried out with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Notice he's calling him Father again. The transition has clearly been made again. He yielded up his spirit, and he died at that point. And while the spectators watched on in numb disbelief, all kinds of things started happening. There was a massive earthquake. The Bible says the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. It says, and behold, the temple curtain was torn in two from the top to the bottom. That veil which separated the most holy place from the holy place was ripped from the top down, and it may not sound like a big deal, but it was 60 feet high, it was 30 feet wide, and it was three inches thick. But this symbolized that the sacrificial system was finally over because what it was pointing to had just happened. So when the centurion and those who were with them, it tells us in Matthew 27, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. And we always tend to focus on the centurion, but notice the Bible doesn't just say it was the centurion. It says on those that were with him, they all greatly feared and said this was the Son of God. And I think it's kind of cool that within seconds of Jesus dying, we are having multiple conversions already. I think we underestimate the effect that Jesus had on this crowd. We get a hint of it in Luke 23. Luke 23, 48 says, The whole crowd came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts, and returned. Obviously, an enormous emotional impact was made. Even on the Quaternion, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the Roman killing crew assigned to Jesus, And they would have been so numb to scenes like this. But they were touched. But they had to certify the deaf because if any condemned man survived, they themselves would be held responsible and they would be executed. So a formality had to be completed. John 19.34 says, But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So we should talk for just a second about a widespread theory that you're going to hear from atheists if you've never heard it. It's called the swoon theory. Has anyone ever heard of it? Well, so you're prepared if you do. Um, Proponents of this theory say that Jesus did not die on the cross. He fainted from the trauma. It was awful, but he just fainted. He was buried in the tomb, and he later revived and crawled his way out and appeared to the disciples half dead. That's what a lot of atheists believe. 
There are so many problems with this theory that I could spend an hour just destroying it in front of you, but I'm sure you don't want to hear that. But let's just look at one fact. The Roman soldier's action with the spear certified and confirmed the death. If he wasn't death, dead before this, this definitely killed him. Keep in mind, like I said, if a condemned prisoner escaped, these, this quaternion was going to die. So do you think they really would have skipped this step or done it half-heartedly? And you'll notice in the Gospel of John, John actually says, I saw this and I am testifying that it is true that they thrust the spear into his side. He knew it was so crucial to understand this point. To claim, to claim that a person could have survived a spear into the heart is simply ridiculous. So the spear would have pierced into the right ventricle of the heart and the lung. And doctors who have studied the crucifixion say that based on all the abuse that Jesus received over the previous 24 hours, there would have been fluid buildup in the uh, pleural lung cavity, and there would have been what's called pericardial effusion, which is fluid buildup around the sac around your heart, the pericardium. So it's interesting what John confirms to us, even though they knew nothing about medicine really at that time compared to today, it medically makes sense that you would see blood come out and you would see water come out. But there's a spiritual application to these two streams as well. Out of Jesus came two things, and they came out in a very specific order. And Jesus is offering two things to you, and he's offering them to you in the same specific order. What came out of Jesus first? Blood. First, you have to be cleansed by the blood, which means your first step is you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross, not just for the sins of the world, but for your sins. And this will cause you to confess and forsake those sins and receive Jesus as your Savior. But there was also water. And Jesus said to his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go, for if I do not go, the Comforter will not come to you. We must be filled with his Spirit. If to be sanctified, it represents the water. This is how Jesus dwells in our hearts, how we can dwell in all of our hearts at the same time and be in more than one place at the same time as through the Spirit. Praise God for that. If Jesus was still here in our presence, we'd probably think that was pretty cool, but we would not be able to experience the power that we can experience today. You know, there's another interesting parallel in Scripture between Jesus on the cross and Jesus described as the second Adam. Think about it, when Jesus died on the cross, he went to sleep. The Bible does describe death as a sleep. And then after he went to sleep, his side was opened up by a Roman spear. Now with Adam, God put Adam to sleep, and he opened up Adam's side too, didn't he? And what came out of Adam's side? Eve, his bride. When Jesus' side was opened up, that wound, what came out of it, what did it create? It created his bride, his church, us. Millions upon millions upon millions of Christians because of this wound, because of his death. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, but we need to talk about one more thing, and it's really, really, really important. Jesus cried out, it is finished. It meant the debt had been paid. It meant something else too, though. It was not just the sins of the world, the debt fully paid for mankind that Jesus was referencing. Something else needed to be answered. Something else had been in question for a long, long time. You see, the character of God had been questioned. It had been in question for ages and ages. And the one who did that, Lucifer, was a being of wonderful power, a being of light, high in position, trusted by all. And because of that position, his questioning of God was the more influential, the more confusing to the unfallen. And I think that is the reason he was able to get a third of the angels on his side, because of who he was. But everyone wondered, could God be a tyrant, as Lucifer is claiming? If anyone would know, it would be Lucifer, his right-hand man. Were his ways and laws put in place for our happiness, or were they actually there to satisfy the whims of a dictator? At the cross, these, an these questions were finally answered. Selected Messages says, at the death of Christ, Satan saw that he was defeated. He saw his true character was clearly revealed before all heaven, and that the heavenly beings and the worlds that God had created would be holy on the side of God. He saw that his prospects of future influence with them would be entirely cut off. At the cross, God proved his character, and Satan's character was finally fully revealed, finally understood. As our pastor pointed out here last week, God showed that he is love. He is the definition of it. There is no higher definition. 
Satan claimed his ways were preferable and better than God's ways, and time had to be given for those principles to be worked out. And all you have to do is pick up a newspaper today and you can see how Satan's principles have worked out pretty bad. Desire Rages again says, by his life and death, Christ proved that God's justice did not destroy mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges were refuted. God had given man unmistakable evidence of his love. And so now of God's mercy fully, fully revealed at the cross, did the devil just give up? Or did he try a new deception? Satan declared that mercy destroyed justice, that the death of Christ abrogated the Father's law. But had it been possible for the law to be changed or abrogated, then Christ need not have died. Think about that for a minute. I think Satan, realizing that the penalty was now paid, that the humanity was now saved, he thought, well, I'll just try to take away the whole reason that Jesus died so that his death will gradually lose any meaning. Because Jesus had to die because the law had been broken by humanity. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin is the transgression of the law. Paul says, I had not known sin but by the law, I had not, except, because I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. The law is a standard by which sin is defined, and if you take it away, it appears there is no more sin. And a sacrifice for sin would then seem irrelevant. But at Calvary, God vindicated his character, he vindicated his law, and he showed us through those awful six hours the malignity of sin. We would not have been able to see it any other way. The price that was paid for us, it measures how horrible sin truly is. So now Christ is taken down from the cross and laid in uh, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and his followers went home to observe the worst Sabbath of their lives, I'm sure. And after that, the sun went down on that Sabbath. It seemed to be Earth's darkest day, but within a matter of hours, the whole world was about to change. And that would be the subject of next time, the resurrection. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for making this sacrifice for us, for becoming our sins. We thank you for all of your blessings, everything you do for us each day. In a thousand ways, you show your mercy and your love to us, through, even through our breath. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to realize the price that was paid for us and that we will therefore glorify you in our bodies and our spirits, which are yours, as Paul says. Help us to realize the price, Lord, how high it was, and help that to transform us as we deal with our struggles and sins and issues through the coming week, we'll realize I am valuable because a high, high price was paid for me. Let us not believe the devil's lies that we're worth nothing, but we're actually citizens of the coming kingdom. I pray that you'll help us have a heart for ministry and for service, Lord, and for reaching out to others. When we see friends and neighbors and coworkers Help us to realize the price was paid for them too and help us to come out of ourselves. It is very difficult sometimes, but help us to come out of ourselves and to trust you in faith and to reach out to those around us and to show them love and to witness to them. We just pray we'll be led by your spirit. Please bless this church. Please bless all the churches in the area and help us to come closer to you. Help us to focus more on what you did for us at Calvary. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.